If you have your Bibles, go ahead and make your way to James chapter 5. And I will do the same. James chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 18 this morning. Shortly after Dallas Theological Seminary was started in 1924, it almost went under. Uh, It came to the point of bankruptcy. All the creditors were ready to foreclose at 12 noon on a certain day. Uh, That morning, the founders of the school met in the president's office to pray that God would provide. In that prayer meeting was Harry Ironside. And when it was his turn to pray, uh, he prayed, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. Well, just about that time, this is a true story, maybe you've heard of it, uh, a tall Texan in boots, an open-collar shirt, strolled into the business office. He says, howdy to the church secretary. I just sold two carloads of cattle over in Fort Worth. I've been trying to make a business deal go through, but it just won't work. I feel God wants me to give the money to this seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. And he handed it over. The secretary took the check, knowing uh, something of the critical nature uh, of the hour, went to the door of the prayer meeting, and she knocked on the door. Uh, Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, the president and founder of the school, answered, uh, took the check from her, uh, and he looked at the amount, and it was the exact amount uh, of the debt that they owed. Uh, Then he recognized the name on the check as the cattleman, and he turned to Dr. Ironside, and he said, Harry, God sold the cattle. He did. And God provided. God provided for their need. There is power through prayer. And we've all heard stories like this. Uh, Our mind maybe jumps to George Mueller, uh, a man of of great prayer, a man who who God richly supplied for, who richly answered uh, his prayers. Maybe, uh, Maybe God has answered your prayers. I'm sure many of us have experienced answered prayer. And yet for some reason, despite all of that, despite the stories, despite the answered prayer, we tend to fail at prayer. We tend to make prayer uh, low on our priority list. For some reason, we struggle with it. We struggle to pray personally. We struggle to pray, perhaps even more so, to pray corporately. But there is power through prayer. Do we believe that today? Do we really believe that there is power through prayer? like the story we just read, like thinking of George Mueller. Do we really believe that? Maybe for them, but is it true for us? Well, James is going to tell us this morning that it's true for us as well. That spiritual success, spiritual perseverance depends on our prayer lives. James wrote to a persecuted church, a church that was dealing with oppression and hardship and trouble. Many had become discouraged. And so James writes his letter to encourage them. Uh, to encourage them to endure, to persevere, and to be patient during these difficult times. And he says, at the heart of endurance, at the heart of getting through the tough times, is a commitment to prayer. We need prayer, because there is power through prayer. Look at uh, James chapter 5 with me. Uh, we're going to look at verses 16 through 18, but I'm going uh, to go back up to verse 13, which we looked at last time, just to uh, get the whole context here. It says in Verse 13, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man uh, subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we can spend together, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for prayer. Father, help us. Help us to see the power that is available to us because you will work through prayer. Father, mold us and shape us through this passage. Lord, I ask that your, your power uh, would work in our hearts, would work in our lives, uh, that you would work uh, through me, that you would speak through this passage to each one of our hearts this morning, that you might be glorified. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, James tells us, again, our, our spiritual success, anything that we want to do uh, in the Christian life, our endurance, our patience depends on God. 
who in His wisdom and His sovereignty has chosen to work through prayers. And we don't have to reconcile exactly how that happens. Uh, we have to recognize that it does. Uh, that God works through prayer. Somehow He has chosen to do that. Uh, and we need to understand that the Bible calls us to pray. Not to necessarily understand how it all works out, how God works through it all. That's not up to us to, to figure out. What's up to us is that we ought to pray. That we should be praying. And, in verse, and, and our text uh, this morning tells us that we should be praying together. Uh, Verses 13 through 15 uh, talked about uh, individual prayer. Is there any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Uh, In verse 14, uh, it talks about pastoral prayer. Uh, Is any sick? Let him call for the elders. And now in verses 16 and following, he he calls all of us as a congregation to pray. To pray together, in fact. When things get too bad, uh, we have to sometimes call the elders, he says. But before that happens is what he's going to look at here. Before you get to that point, let's make it a habit of getting with one another and praying with one another. And so the idea here here is uh, the cure for our spiritual weaknesses is prayer. We need to be praying. Uh, And so the church that really has it together, the church that, that, that is going to stay together and stick together is the church that confesses and prays together. And that's what James is going to tell us here. And so before we get into uh, the confession and the prayer, I want to look at that last sentence in verse 16, because that's, that's kind of our, our proposition here, the proposition for James, the, 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 uh, the linchpin of everything else. He says, uh, that last sentence, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you have the ESV, it says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Or the New American Standard, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And so the idea here is that prayer, there's power through prayer. Uh, And that's the story we looked at. There's power through prayer. Uh, And he says, uh, the prayers of a righteous person can accomplish a whole lot. So we should pray. We should pray when we're discouraged. We should pray when we're troubled. We should pray when we're hurting. When we need help spiritually. When we need help physically. In everything, we ought to pray. And that's what James says. That's what the Bible says, right? Paul says, pray without ceasing. Never stop. Make it a a habit to be continually in prayer. Why? Because there is power available to us in prayer. I read about a new army recruit who was given guard duty at 2 a.m. in the morning. He did his best for a while. How many could do that, right? Uh, He did his best for a while, but about 4 o'clock came and he fell asleep. Uh, He awakened to find the officer of the day standing right in front of him. And he remembered that there was a heavy penalty for falling asleep on the job. Uh, And so, keeping his wits about him, he he kept his head bowed for a few minutes, and he then looked up and he said, Amen. Um, So he pretended he prayed, right? Prayer is powerful. It can get you out of trouble. You got this man out of trouble. But prayer is powerful. It can keep us out of trouble too. Spiritual trouble. That's not what James was talking about here. Um, Pretending to pray to to get out of trouble. He was talking about actually praying to keep you out of spiritual trouble. There is power through prayer. And he says that the prayer of a righteous person can accomplish so much. Well, who is righteous? Maybe that's my problem, right? Maybe this is why God doesn't seem to be working through my prayers or answering my prayers, because maybe I'm not righteous. Who is righteous? Well, James is talking about those who have been redeemed. Those who are believers. Those who are Christians. He's talking about anyone who is here this morning who has turned to Jesus Christ Uh, as their Savior. Turn from their sin and turn to Him uh, for their salvation. So if you've come to believe in Christ, by faith in Him alone, you have this righteousness. It's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ that has been transferred into your account, but you have been made righteous through the blood of Christ, and because of that, you can have power through prayer. That's what James is saying. But also, he's also talking about in the context here, those who are walking rightly with God. Those who are, uh, who are pursuing Him, pursuing His purposes. Proverbs 15.29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. And so for James, the opposite would be what he talked about back in uh, chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. So the righteous person is the person who is not seeking to 
gain things for personal uh, glory, but gain things for God's glory. And so he says that type of person who is pursuing God's will, who is seeking to please God with their lives, who is a believer, can expect God to work through his prayer life. Psalm 66, we read, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if I'm holding on to sin, if I'm rebelling against God, then maybe God's not going to listen. But if I'm trying to please Him with my life, if my direction is one that is trying to please God, then you are called um, righteous and God will hear you. It's those who are living a repentant lifestyle that he's talking about here. He's not talking about the spiritual elite. It's not the Pope or, or, or just the pastor or anything like that. He says ordinary Christians, the prayer of ordinary Christians who are trying to live a righteous life in this world, his prayers are effective and they accomplish much. So ordinary believers pray to an extraordinary God. That's the idea. The power is in him. The power is not in us. And so James says because there is power through prayer, we ought to... Pray for one another. In verse 16, he says we ought to pray for one another. And why wouldn't we? If there is power in prayer, power through prayer, why wouldn't we want to pray for one another? In, in uh, verses 14 and, and 15, we saw that we needed the prayer of the elders when we were overtaken by our battle with sin and battle with this life. Uh, and we get to the point of spiritual exhaustion and, and weariness. Uh, and, and you get to the point where you couldn't even pray for yourself, so you needed to call in the elders to pray for you. Well, here, he says, we have another weapon in our battle against sin, our battle against um, oppression, persecution, and that thing, and that's one another. That's each other. That's confession of sin to each other and prayer for one another. And so he turns his attention away from those who have been defeated by this spiritual battle, uh, and he turns to the congregation as a whole. And he says, before that happens, before you get to the point of despair and discouragement, make it a habit of praying with each other, praying for each other. And in that prayer, make a, a habit of confessing to one another. That's what he's saying. Because the prayers of the righteous can help you through spiritual discouragement and spiritual weakness. And so, for that reason, you pray together. He says, don't wait until the bottom falls out in your life. Don't wait until life is so overwhelming that you are uh, one step away from leaving it all, that you're just, before you're discouraged and down and, uh, and you have to call the elders. He says, maintain relationships with one, with one another where there's confession and prayer, there's mutual accountability and fellowship so that you can keep each other uh, going and keep each other restored. It's a vital aspect of fellowship within a church. And the idea here is that we continually confess sin. We continually pray for one another. It's supposed to be a regular occurrence within a church. And we've, we've been talking about James uh, saying in trials, uh, in, in, in affliction, there's a wrong way to use your tongue. There's a wrong way to speak with impatience. Well, the right way is confession and prayer. Now, the word confess here is different than the word in 1 John 1.9 where confession is made to God. There the word is homologeo, which means to agree uh, with God about your sin. Uh, here the word is exomologeo, which means to express it, to let it out, to tell others about it. That is to share your struggle with somebody else. In other words, we can let other people within our fellowship know what we're going through. That's scary, right? We can, we can tell others when we're weak when we're weary, when we're exhausted, when we're, when we're uh, down and discouraged. We can admit and we can acknowledge our, uh, our faults, it says. That word is um, trespasses or where you stumble, where you're weak, where you get tripped up, your failures. We can acknowledge that to one another. So the idea is that we are to open up, we're to share, we're to seek forgiveness with one another so that we can more effectively pray for one another. When we actually know what's going on in each other's lives, we can actually help one another. Right? That's what, that's what uh, James is saying here. This isn't confession to a priest, as you might hear from the, the Catholic Church. That's one, this is the verse that they would use to promote that because... We know, the Bible tells us, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We don't have to go through a priest. And it doesn't say confess to a priest. It says confess to one another. 
here. Um, and so James is clearly not talking about that. And here, I don't think the purpose is necessarily for forgiveness, unless, of course, a specific offense is made against another believer. I think the issue here is more that we confess our sins to one another so that we can pray for one another more effectively, so that we can be renewed spiritually and, and restored. And it's the idea of, of going to get with each other in order to prevent us from giving in to sin. It's an, it's an accountability. It's mutual accountability here. It's real fellowship. That's one of the reasons why God gives us the church. Because uh, when, we, when we isolate ourselves, when we close ourselves off from others, that's when sin can grow. and we're, That's where sin can do its work. Uh, John MacArthur writes, The inspired writer was well aware that sin is most dangerous to an isolated believer. Sin seeks to remain private and secret, but God wants it exposed and dealt with in the loving fellowship of other believers. And so when we try to live the Christian life alone... That's when we're more susceptible to give in to sin. That's when we're going to keep that sin alive in our lives. But when we're confessing it to one another, then it's out there. And then there's accountability for it. You know, if I admit I'm struggling with X, Y, Z to a brother in Christ, now I'm, I'm humbling myself first, right? There's humility. There's nothing wrong with that. God wants us to be humble. But it also, now I've given that other believer a right to ask me about it. Right? Hey, how are you doing with X, Y, Z? You still struggling with that? Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you asked. Um, and then, can you pray for me still? Right? That helps you overcome it because now I know I'm going to have to answer to him too. So I need to get this dealt with. But when we're on our own, like a, a sheep that's on its own is more susceptible to predators. Uh, when we go out on our own, we let that sin live. Right? I don't have to get rid of it. I mean, we, we want to, but I can still play around with it. I can still leave it in my life. But if I have somebody checking on me, that's incentive. That's motivation. I think that's what James is getting at. He wants confession and transparency as believers so that we can pray for one another more effectively. I mean, that makes us bristle up a little bit, especially up here in New England. I don't, I don't want anybody to know that I'm weak in any area of my life. I've got this. I'm independent. I can't let anyone know that I'm a sinner. Well, I hate to spoil it for you, but we already know. Uh, if they knew this about me, they would judge me. But just remember, if, if they're judging, that's a, that's a sin that they need to deal with too. Right? It's not about you. And so we get this idea that somehow we have to have uh, it all together when we come to church. We don't have it all together. None of us do. And I've, I've heard it said that we, we treat church more like a job interview where we put our, our best face on, our, our, our nice clothes, not saying we should dress uh, in holy jeans, not holy jeans, those are sanctified <laughs> jeans. Uh, I'm talking about uh, ones with rips and holes in them and that type of thing. But we treat it more like a job interview. We want to put our best foot forward when it's really more like an emergency room that we all have issues that need to be treated. Right? Don't we though? And the more we keep our sin to ourselves, the easier it is to go back to. And so James says, confess your faults one to another, so that you may effectively pray for one another. And that's the idea. We're a family as a church. And so we are to be able to admit those things to one another without fear of judgment, without fear of gossip. I don't know if I've, I don't know if I've seen it. Maybe you have. But this is what we are to do. Romans 15, 14 says we're to admonish one another. That means reprove gently. It means we're to counsel and help each other out with their sin with a view of changing the behavior. Well, we can't do that if we don't know. And I'm not saying, well, tell me all your sins so I can go blab it, because that's not what the idea is. We tell it to one person, and they help us through it. Galatians 6, 2 says we bear one another's burdens. And for that to happen, we need to be open and honest and willing to uh, open ourselves up to that type of accountability. And I, like I said, I don't think James means that we take turns on Sunday mornings confessing all of our sins to each other, every single one of them. I think the issue here is, is spiritual strength and, uh, and, and trying to endure uh, and, and admitting those things that we're particularly struggling with at that time. 
Uh, and I think Wednesday night prayer meeting is a, is a perfect time for this. It's a perfect opportunity for this to take place. On Wednesday nights, if you're not familiar with it, we break up into small groups or partners, depending on how many people are there. And I, I, I could see that as a time where you developed where you develop this kind of accountability with somebody. Um, obviously, you probably have a, a spouse at home, maybe, that, that's there for that too. But So before you pray together, you know, if you're dealing with an issue, you can confess it to your prayer partner and ask for prayer about it. You know, maybe, you, maybe you battle depression, and nobody knows it. And you don't feel like you can share it with anyone because they, they, they have to think I have it all together. They can't know this about me because they will judge me. Well, that's sad if that's the case. Because we're not perfect. We're all progressing toward sanctification. Some of us are farther along than others. But as believers, we're all trying. And sometimes we need somebody else to help us. To pray for us. And so, for me, I would like to see Wednesday nights uh, be used for that. To take an opportunity to bear one another's burdens. Not just the physical ailments, but the spiritual the emotional, the mental things. The things that we hate to admit that we're dealing with. It's easy to say, well, my arm hurts, can you pray for me? It's easy to say, I broke my leg, can you pray for me? And that's not weakness, but that's not humility. Uh, we all see that, but when it says, when, you know, when I struggle with, with pleasing men, or I have a hard time, I fear man, that's a sin, and I struggle with it, help me, will you pray for me? That's one I struggle with. Full disclosure. Would you pray for me? And so, I see Wednesday nights as an opportunity for that. And James doesn't mean we confess every specific sin that we deal with because we would have no time to do anything else, right? Uh, but those area, areas of our lives where we're prone to slip until God gives us the victory over those. And so that's what James is saying, so that we can effectively pray for one, another, for one another. He says, so that you may be healed. And then he goes on, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Because prayer brings healing. Last time we looked at it, it was more of a spiritual healing here. Uh, and he says this confession and prayer, uh, prayer provides healing. Uh, he's talking spiritual healing here. Restoration. Uh, the word for healing is, is often used for that in the scriptures. In Hebrews 12, uh, verses 12 through 13, uh, is particularly helpful because the writer there is, is dealing with similar issues uh, as James is. And he says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, those who are discouraged and down, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Spiritual restoration is what he's talking about of those who had grown weary in the battle. Uh, and it's easy to grow weary in the battle. Uh, it seems the world is against us, and Jesus said they would be. And so it's easy for us to be discouraged. And so James says, get with one another, confess with one another, pray for one another, that you may be restored, that you may be revived, that your hearts might be revived. Uh, in First Peter, uh, it talks of spiritual forgiveness or healing from sin that Christ purchases on the cross for us. It says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live righteous. By His wounds you have been healed. And like I mentioned, James, this, is, this is what Paul is talking about in Galatians 6 when he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in, spirit of, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ law of Christ, of loving God and, and loving one another. And that's the idea as a church. We are to be doing that. We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to pray for one another so that we don't get to that point of, of spiritual uh, discouragement and being dragged down. And so are we doing that? The church that prays together stays together, as I mentioned. We need this in our lives. We need each other. And so I'd invite you to come out on Wednesday nights and pray with other believers. Use that time for spiritual accountability. And if you're nervous about praying out loud with someone else, I understand. More confession time. I used to be scared of it. I used to be scared to pray out loud. Uh, in fact, in the old uh, church building, they used to ask uh, us to take the offering when we were teenagers. Well, if you were maybe third or fourth in the door, you probably weren't going to get asked. So uh, I think, I don't know if Adam did this, but I know I tried to be one of the last ones in so I wouldn't be asked to take the offering so I wouldn't have to pray out loud. 
Right? That was my little sneaky scheme. Uh, because I was nervous about praying out loud with others. And maybe, uh, so he, I guess it was true for him too. Uh, but it's, you know, I came to realize that, and so I avoided prayer meeting too, because I didn't want to have to pray with somebody else. What if I'm not a good prayer or, or, or whatever? What if I wasn't good at praying? Kids can pray. You know? It's not, it's not that scary. If, if you can talk... You can pray. Even if you can't talk, you can pray. God will listen. God's not judging you by the words that you use. And neither is anyone else for that matter. I remember the first prayer I, I, I said for the offering. I stumbled over my words. I don't even know if I prayed for the offering. I don't even know what I said. And then somebody came up to me afterwards and was like, you know, it was good to hear you pray in church. He didn't hear my words. You know, God heard my heart. So if you're nervous about praying with somebody, you, you can do it silently too. Nobody's going to judge you for it. So don't let that keep you from Wednesday nights. It's too important. Prayer is too important to, to be afraid to do it, to neglect it. If you can pray at home, you can pray here. There's no perfect person to pray. And so I'd invite you to do that. Because there is power through prayer. And so we are to confess and pray for one another. And secondly, uh, he says, because there is power through prayer, we should pray fervently like Elijah. Verses 17 and 18, he says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And so James has been saying in this, this whole passage, the reason why you pray in difficulty, the reason why you pray uh, when you're discouraged, why you ask your pastor to pray for you, why you confess your sins and your struggles with one another, is because there is power through prayer. And like I said, the real power is not in our words. The real power is in God, who works through prayer, who has chosen to work through prayer. And so he points us to Elijah. He says, just look at what God did through this man. And he begins by saying an important thing. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Saying essentially that Elijah is no different than you and me. His prayers weren't answered because he was some type of superhero or anything like that. The idea is the power is not in the one that's praying, it's the, it's the one into whom we pray. The power is in God. Um, and, and so he says, Elijah is just like us. And James had a good reason for saying this because the Jewish audience that he wrote to held Elijah in very high esteem. He was kind of like a superhero to them. Uh, According to one writer, by the time James was writing this letter, traditions had grown up around Elijah that had actually ascribed superhuman traits to him. So this is where uh, they were coming from. Well, well, I can't pray like him because he was a Superman type of person. And if you know anything about Elijah, you can kind of understand why. I mean, think of what God accomplished through this man. Uh, he was fed by ravens. I don't know if I'd want that, but uh, in that situation, it was understandable, but birds fed him. Uh, he raised the dead. He called down fire from heaven, slew the false prophets of Baal. He outran uh, a chariot. How would you like to be able to run, run a, a race car, right? Uh, and then uh, he finally vanished away from the earth in a chariot of fire. So in the eyes of the Jewish audience, he was kind of a legend, kind of a, a Paul Bunyan, uh, Pecos Bill type of person. And so James wants to make sure that they realize that that's not what he was. He was not a superhero. He didn't wear a cape. He was a regular person like you and me. He says he was a prophet of God. He was obedient to God. And God through Elijah did do miraculous things, of course. But he was not perfect. Uh, in Elijah, we have a man who got very discouraged, very depressed. After a spiritual victory, after he outran uh, uh, Jezebel and Ahab, and they were pursuing him. He feared for his life, and, and he was down. And he was as much like James's audience, discouraged at oppression, fearing for their lives. And so this was a man who dealt with similar things, with the same type of things that we deal with, that he was no better than any of us. And so James says he was an ordinary man, an ordinary person. And what did he do? He prayed earnestly. Literally, that's written, he prayed with prayer. It's an interesting way to say it. He prayed with prayer. It's an idiom which emphasizes passion, intensity, perseverance, uh, tenacity, I guess. And so do we pray like that? 
Do we pray with that kind of vigor, with that kind of energy and intensity? That's how Elijah prayed. Do we seek God's power and His working in our lives? How we pray? Do we seek God's working, God's power in the, the life of our church? Are we praying for that? Are we praying passionately for that? Because we need that power too. Last week, many of us were without power. We could flip on a switch, no matter how many times we went into a room, we flip on the switch and nothing happened. It didn't matter how many times we tried it. We couldn't make anything happen. The same thing is true in our Christian lives. We can't make anything happen. We can't make spiritual things happen. We don't have the power. We need God's power through prayer to endure spiritually, uh, to overcome uh, sin, to see souls saved, to bear fruit for Him. For any of that to happen, we need His power, and so we must pray. It tells us that Elijah passionately prayed. He didn't, he didn't necessarily run through a, a prayer list, like, a, like reciting a grocery list back to uh, your wife or your spouse. He prayed with vigor. He prayed with persistence, with passion. Prayer was something he was compelled to do because he depended on God. Are we dependent? We are dependent on God, but do we realize it? Do we realize just how dependent on Him we are? Many of us didn't realize how dependent we were on CMP uh, until this storm. We are far more dependent on God. And He's there. He's available to us through prayer. And so he says, pray like Elijah. Look at what happened through him. Now, if you go back to, which we don't have time to do, but if you go back to, uh, to 1 Kings 17-19, through 19, you're not going to find uh, Elijah's prayer for the drought. Uh, but what you will read is, uh, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Um, he says that. He was confident in that. And evidently, according to James, he had prayed for it too. But Elijah could say this with confidence because that's what God had promised to do. He had promised to withhold dew and rain from the land if his people turned to other gods. And of course they had. They had turned to Baal worship. Uh, Baal was a false god, which ironically was the god of rain. So for the true god to cause a drought would prove who the real god was. And that's of course what happened. And James says for us that Elijah prayed passionately and fervently that this would take place. He was praying that God's will would be done, essentially, and God answered those prayers. And the same thing can be true for you and me. When our prayers line up with God's will, when we are seeking His glory, that is to make Him known, we can be sure that God will answer those prayers, that He will be glorified. And that's what happened uh, in this uh, account of Elijah. And we read in 1 Kings 18.42, after the prophets of Baal were defeated uh, and scorched with fire, that God was shown to be the true God. And the people said in, in verse 39, before that, when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they, and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They understood. So then, uh, Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees and he went to pray for rain, for the drought to be over. And he prayed fervently, it tells us, seven times. Uh, and then, uh, in 1 Kings 18.45, in a little while, the heavens grew black, the clouds went in wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Elijah fervently prayed. He prayed for the restoration of his people. And that's what James is trying to get at here. The restoration and revival for his people who are down and discouraged. This is what James's congregation needed. They needed spiritual renewal. They needed spiritual revival. And it would only come through confession and prayer. Because there's power through prayer. And so James says to us, God says to us through James today, if you're going through tough times, if you're dealing with hardship and discouragement, if you're weak and weary from the battle, you need to pray. And if you can't pray, get your pastor to pray for you. If you're struggling... Lean on one another. Lean on each other and pray for one another. The bottom line is no matter what you're dealing with, no matter where you are in your life, you need God's help. You need God's power. And that power is available to us through prayer. And that's what James says here. Because God works through prayer. Maybe you've heard the story, but things looked bleak for the children of George Mueller's orphanage at Ashley Downs in England. 
It was time for breakfast, and there was no food. A small girl whose father was a close friend of, of George Mueller's was visiting the home that day, uh, and Mueller took her hand and said, come and see what the father will do. In the dining room, long tables were set, empty plates, empty mugs. There, not only was there no food in the kitchen, there was no money in the, ca- the account of the home. So there was nothing. Just empty bowls, empty plates, empty, empty glasses. And Mueller prayed, Dear Father, we thank you for what you are going to give us to eat. Immediately, he heard a knock on the door. When they opened it, there stood the local baker. And he said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you had no breakfast, so I got up at 2 o'clock and baked fresh bread, and here it is. Mueller thanked him and gave praise to God. Soon a second knock was heard. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down right outside, and he said, I'd like to give the children my milk because I need to empty the cart so I can fix it. And so God had provided through those prayers. How many of us want to see God work in our lives? God works through prayer. How many of us want to see God work in our lives? How many of us want to see God work through this church? We have to pray. Are we praying? Is prayer a priority for all of us? It should be, because without it, there is no power. Without God working through prayer, there is no power in our lives and in the lives of our church. And so we must pray And we must make prayer a priority because as James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we want to see God work. We want to see God accomplish His will on this earth. We've got to be people of prayer. There's no way around it. Let's pray.